Cyclone Kenneth leads to five deaths and dangerous floods in Mozambique as rescuers struggle to evacuate people living in the flooded city of Pemba. A closer look inside the counter-terrorism fight in Burkina Faso. And what makes African feminism unique? Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Tonight we begin with the devastating aftermath of Cyclone Kenneth in Mozambique, where the death toll has climbed to at least 38 people. Heavy rains on Monday have grounded eight, uh, eight flights to the southeastern African nation for the second consecutive day, slowing efforts to reach survivors of the powerful storm. The country's disaster management agency says more than 23,000 people have no shelter and nearly 35,000 homes have been destroyed. Lauren Anthony reports on the anguish in Mozambique. Trapped inside their homes, Mozambique's victims of Cyclone Kenneth await rescue. In the northern city of Pemba, they face rising floodwaters. Brown rivers course the streets, submerging roads. Many homes have already collapsed and heavy rains have brought fresh fears that the worst is yet to come. Cyclone Kenneth first made landfall in the province of Cabo Delgado late last Thursday. Winds of up to 174 miles per hour and storm surges flattened entire villages. It's the second cyclone to hit the country in just six weeks, following on from devastating Cyclone Ide, which is said to have left more than 1.8 million people in need of aid. The Mozambican government has said Cyclone Kenneth has killed several people, but rescuers said they had increasing concerns for the safety of thousands of families, cut off after rivers burst their banks outside the city. Mozambique now also faces a cholera epidemic after the cyclone wiped out water and sanitation facilities. The United Nations has granted Mozambique and the Comoros Islands $13 million in emergency aid. They hope to provide food and water to those in need and repair damage to infrastructure. But the World Bank estimates the countries affected by Kenneth will need over $2 billion to recover. That report was by Lauren, Lauren Anthony of Reuters. Now, a bad situation in the West African nation of Burkina Faso appears to be getting worse. In April, more than 60 people have died in ethnic clashes inflamed by Islamist extremists seeking to gain a stronghold in the Sahel. In part one of a three-part series on Burkina Faso, VOA Pentagon correspondent Kalabam brings us a, re a rare look inside the counter-terror war in the landlocked nation where America is hoping local forces can increase pressure on the militants even as the U.S. military decreases its force members in that region. In the vast, dusty plateau of West Africa's Sahel region, the fight is heating up against an insurgency fueled by Islamist militants. Burkina Faso has seen more than 230 attacks in just over three years, with no end to the violence in sight. What we fight against, what we see every day, is like a toxin. A toxin that the U.S. ambassador to Burkina Faso tells VOA has quickly spread across a nation virtually untouched by terrorism just a few years ago. They're trying to target the resilience of this community which has lived in harmony for thousands of years. There are Muslims and Christians who are in the same family. Those terrorist groups try to break down a stable uh, society and attack a fragile democracy. Because instability provides terrorists an opening to infiltrate. It happened in Iraq and Somalia. And now, the commander of U.S. Special Forces in Africa tells VOA Islamist groups are planting their flags here. We know that al-Qaeda considers um, the Sahel right here to be a, a very important area for them to deliberately and quietly build infrastructure. Uh, they've been doing this for a number of years and they've been fairly successful. Which is why Hicks says training exercises with Sahel Nation forces are critical. American commandos and international allies teach everything from how to plan operations to how to respond to an ambush, to how to treat and evacuate the wounded, skills that regional partners say make a big difference. Unfortunately, we lost 
two guys or two, our guys during some operation. And if we had this uh, knowledge, maybe we could be able to take care of them, putting tourniquet before taking them to the hospitals. Okay. The U.S. Embassy has heeded the call, giving more funding to Burkina Faso for security assistance. But instead of bringing in more troops, the U.S. is actually decreasing its numbers in West Africa. About 1,000 American troops will remain in the region. And General Hicks says that's still enough forces to help build local security partners. Together, I think we can turn the tide. And this is going to be a long-term problem. But he does not recommend any more cuts. Is the United States winning the counterterror war here? I would tell you at this time we are not winning. And officials say if the terrorists win in Burkina Faso, it could turn into a launch pad for terrorists to expand their influence to West Africa's coast and potentially beyond. Carla Bab, VOA News, Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. Well, in Tuesday's part two on Burkina Faso, Calabam reports from the Burkina Faso capital, Ouagadougou, more than 100,000 people have been displaced in the country this year, according to the United Nations, and the displacements are taking a deep toll on children and teachers forced out of the classroom. Be sure to join us tomorrow for this important VOA special report. In North Africa, Libya is divided by two competing governments, both with international allies and considerable enemies after years of consolidating militias on either side. Now, as eastern fighters are attacking the capital Tripoli and the last round of peace talks have been cancelled, unification seems further away than ever. Viewers have the Madoc reports near the battle lines in the Tripoli suburbs. Less than a month ago, this was a crowded town outside of Tripoli in Libya. Now we are 500 meters from a battle and the town is abandoned. We just drove up to the front lines, but we were quickly told to leave as both sides began exchanging heavy fire. This battle began in early April when forces loyal to General Khalifa Haftar, who leads the split country's eastern military, attacked the city of Tripoli, the nation's capital, declaring he would take it over in about a week. Before this weekend, it looked like Haftar's forces were stalled. But after airstrikes on the city of Tripoli on Saturday night, the fighting became strong again. Reporting from the Anzara suburb of Tripoli, I'm Heather Murdoch, VOA News. Well, talks between Sudanese protesters and the country's military leadership council on the issue of civilian rule are making slow progress. But one group is creating a colorful push to this process. A group of protest artists is painting a three-kilometer-long banner that tells the story of Sudan's ongoing revolution. Rud El Mandap reports from Khartoum. 40-year-old artist Mohamed Ashraf has been in central Khartoum since December, protesting with thousands of Sudanese over fuel and food shortages and the political situation. Just to fall down. Just to fall down. The protesters drove the military to oust President Omar al-Bashir after three decades in power and are now pushing for civilian rule. Ashraf and his fellow artists are creating a three-kilometer-long textile banner to spread that message. Uh, it's uh, to give us the confidence. That place, it's... Um, peaceful, like a, a so, soft talk about freedom, and you know, it's um, entertainment to us, for example, and to impress our vision and our soul. Thousands of artists have worked on the banner, which tells the story of Sudan's present-day revolution and past oppression. They plan to finish within weeks. And if still no civilian rule, raise it at a central protest outside military headquarters. Protesters have refused to leave until the military gives power to a civilian government. But progress in negotiations has raised hopes. Everything looks better now, and I hope a new government will continue in the same spirit. God is great. Sudan has seen popular revolts for democracy in the past that the military put down. Ashraf, however, believes that this time there will be real change. After 30 years, there's one government. <laughs> Any change, it's change. 
but it's hard last uh, period is very hard to us and we this little bit of freedom that what we have now it give us power to go through and forward to to the real freedom inshallah As the demonstration continues into the night, Sudan's protesters lift their lights, hoping for a new dawn after three decades of darkness. Ruth Almondar for VOA News, Khartoum. Feminism has been defined as the theory of the political, economic and social equality of the sexes and organized activity on behalf of women's rights and interests but the idea of feminism can vary depending on where you live. Viewers Maria Medialo looks into what feminism means for Africans. From Nairobi to Conakry, women across Africa are demanding change in attitudes towards sexual harassment, fair wages, access to land and equal opportunities for political leadership. But they're doing it in their own way, says Gwendolyn Michael, professor of anthropology and foreign service at Georgetown University and author of a book on African feminism. In the U.S., women often think feminism means I alone determine what's best for me. But African feminism is very much a different thing. It's about how women interpret their uh, interests and empowerment within the context of where they live and their cultural values. Feminism has historically had negative connotations on the African continent, says Shingirai Matera, who teaches African feminist theory at Rhodes University in South Africa. Feminism, one, is considered to be um, a title that is given to middle class people or people who are white. There's also an attachment to feminism that feminism is anti-men and anti-African cultural systems and Af anti-African um, traditional practices. So in that regard, there are many women who would hesitate to be identified as feminists. Advocating for women's right on the basis of equality of the sexes can be intimidating for some men, but American University professor Kweku Nwama says it shouldn't be the case. Um, it starts with not being afraid of the word feminist and understanding that what's right for our women is right for us as a society, as a continent in general. He says some of the problems require a shift in cultural attitudes and those take a long time. But some countries aren't waiting. Rwanda, for example, has the largest share of seats in parliament in the world held by women. Rwanda is a, a terrific example uh, of what public policy can do to help women. They use quotas, and people say, well, quotas diminish the role of women. No, it doesn't. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you see countries like Tanzania, where the government says you can't go to school if you're pregnant. Dr. Michael says things are evolving on the continent. I'd say beginning about 20 years ago, I began doing a lot of, um, having a lot of conversations with ordinary women who had been supporting various movements, for example, in South Africa, ANC women. And what was fascinating is that these women used to say, I can't talk about feminism until we deal with getting rid of apartheid. Now what we're seeing is that these women are parliamentarians all across the country. They are um, trying to get land laws changed. People like Kenya's environmental political activist Wangari Mathai and South Africa's anti-apartheid activist Winnie Mandela are seen as great feminist inspirations for Matero. But is being a feminist critical in the empowerment of women in general? The simple answer for that um, should be would be no, um, because um, many women across the decades have done work that is feminist what we would consider to be feminist she says the lack of the feminism label in some cases doesn't negate the credibility of their work maria Magalu, voa news washington in 1920 women in the united states gained the right to vote the historic milestone was the culmination of decades of struggle by women working on both state and national levels for political empowerment. Now, a major new exhibit at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery here in Washington 
examines that complex history ahead of the 100th anniversary of that momentous event. Viewers Julie Tabo has the details. As American civilization marched into the new century, the women of the land began to demand a measure of equality with the men. The path for women fighting to gain the right to vote in America was a long and difficult one. It took decades of struggle by activists like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucy Stone. Now a major new exhibition at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery in Washington is presenting a rich visual history of the women's suffrage movement over a span of 130 years. The women's suffrage movement just didn't appear out of nowhere. You know, they had these abolitionist foundations, they had partnerships with the temperance movement, and that is really how they built momentum across the country in the very early stages. The seven-room exhibit features more than 120 objects from 1832 to 1965. Photographic portraits and paintings, books, banners, and posters provide an in-depth look at the people and events that helped shape American history. How many people know, for example, that Victoria Woodhull was the first woman to run for president on the third-party ticket in 1872? Or that activist Lucy Burns served six different prison sentences for picketing the White House? And that a group of American women staged the first major nonviolent march on Washington in 1913? Black women were organizing just as much as white women. About a third of the collection represents women of color, including African Americans who were often excluded by white women from major suffrage organizations. This exhibition works to show a more complete history of the women's suffrage movement by looking at biographies of African Americans, Native Americans, and other women of color um, to complement the maybe the better known story that we have in our textbooks. African American women like abolitionist Sarah Parker Raymond, who filed one of the earliest lawsuits protesting race segregation. Ida B. Wells, who advocated for federal laws against lynching, and Mary Church Terrell, who established the National Association of Colored Women. Today, American women have immense political power. They make up a huge voting bloc. More than 120 women now serve in Congress, and many others are in major leadership roles. If you start from where the exhibition starts in 1830s, and then trace that thread with the suffrage movement up to this very day when women are actually leading our country, you can see the, the great continuum um, and the grand sort of narrative journey that these women had to undergo to achieve that. And I'm really excited to see what happens from here on. Julie Tabo, VOA News, Washington. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Still ahead on Africa 54, tradition meets style on the catwalk in Addis Ababa. But first, a look at Monday's headlines. toll has risen to 38 after Cyclone Kenneth hit Mozambique over the weekend. The casualties are only expected to rise as flooding continues in areas still recovering from Cyclone Idai. In Libya, Tripoli was hit by airstrikes on Saturday night as the rival government in the east, loyal to General Khalifa Haftar, continued to attack the capital city. In Sudan, talks continue Monday between the Sudanese military and opposition groups to discuss the transition of power after the removal of President Omar al-Bashir. Boycotts began on Sunday at the polls in Benin to protest the lack of any opposition candidates to choose from in the parliamentary election. Finally, Saturday marked 25 years since the end of apartheid in South Africa. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. Anguish, pain and heartache poured out of Rabbi Yisrael Goldstein on Sunday. 
as he recounted the terrorist shooting at his Shabbat of Poway synagogue near San Diego that killed one woman and left him and two others wounded. Now, Goldstein said he held up his hands as, his, as the suspect opened fire, wounding him and blowing off his right index finger. But the rabbi says most of his pain came from seeing a beloved charter member of his shul, 60-year-old Laurie Kay, lying down on the floor. I see Laurie laying on the floor unconscious. And her dear husband, Dr. Howard Kay, who's like a brother to me, is trying to resuscitate her. And he faints, and he's laying there on the floor next to his wife. And then the daughter Hannah comes out screaming, Daddy and Mommy, what's going on? This is the most heart-wrenching sight I could have seen. Goldstein cried as he described Kay as a person of unconditional love, who was always there for those in need, regardless of their race or religion. Goldstein said President Donald Trump telephoned him Sunday, speaking for about 15 minutes, sharing his condolences. A White House statement about the call says Trump expressed his love for the Jewish people and the entire community of Poway. Goldstein says the president was very comforting. The rabbi also appealed to all Jews to go to their synagogues this Friday night, the start of the Jewish Shabbat, uh, to show solidarity and that terrorism will never prevail. After releasing a redacted version of, a spe of Special Counsel Robert Mueller's report on the Russia investigation, U.S. Attorney General William Burr takes center stage once again this week with two scheduled appearances before legislative committees on Capitol Hill. As viewers Michael Bowman reports, Democrats are demanding the full and redacted Mueller report and are determined to continue investigating President Trump while Republicans are eager to turn the page and focus on other matters. Lawmakers expect to hear directly from the man who decided which portions of the Mueller report Americans could read and which portions were blacked out. Before releasing the redacted version, Attorney General Barr held a news conference in which he stressed Mueller's bottom line findings. The Russian government sought to interfere in our election process. But thanks to the special counsel's thorough investigation, we now know that the Russian operatives who perpetrated these schemes did not have the cooperation of President Trump or the Trump campaign. Barr also put forth narratives favorable or sympathetic to President Trump. As he said from the beginning, there was in fact no collusion. There is substantial evidence to show that the president was frustrated and angered by his sincere belief that the investigation was undermining his presidency, propelled by his political opponents, and fueled by illegal leaks. Democrats seethed, accusing America's top law enforcement officer of acting like an attorney for the president. Unfortunately, Attorney General Barr is compromised and essentially has decided to manipulate the uh, the interpretation of the report rather than making sure that the American people have a chance to get a transparent look at it. Republicans came to Barr's defense. The thought <clears throat> that uh, Bill Barr at age 69 his second <laughs> tour as attorney general uh, would do anything <clears throat> to, to tarnish his own image or reputation is completely ridiculous. The Mueller report documented multiple instances where Trump may have acted to obstruct justice, but did not conclude the president actually did so as a criminal matter. Democrats say congressional probes must go on. Many in the Trump orbit, including Donald Trump himself, openly sought to benefit from and even encouraged Russia's interference in our election. The president and his team then repeatedly lied to the American people and tried to cover up these reckless and criminal activities. But Democrats appear split on whether and how fast to initiate impeachment proceedings against the president. By contrast, Republicans are united in calling for Congress and the nation to focus on other matters. Which means uh, no collusion, uh, no obstruction, 
uh, and I think generally people are ready to move on. Barr is scheduled to testify before both the Senate and House Judiciary Committees, although doubts surfaced about his appearance before the House panel. The Justice Department reportedly objects to the committee's intention to allow staff attorneys to question the Attorney General. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. While and here now is what's trending. Designers in Ethiopia are turning an ancient traditional cloth into modern fashion to keep their culture alive and promote the sector. Faya Ada cloth is culturally associated with the Oromo people and means traditional dress in the Oromo language. To encourage young ordinary Ethiopians to rock the fabric in different styles and designs, designers recently put together a fashion show in Addis Ababa showcasing contemporary designs made out of Faya Ada. The cloth, which is hand-woven, is made from 100% cotton and is worn on a day-to-day -day basis in the countryside. However, in big cities, it's only worn during important cultural ceremonies like certain festivals and weddings. Meanwhile, in Brazil, models wearing weapons on helmets and contrasting colorful prints are strutted down the runway in as Brazil designer Ronaldo Fraga presented his collection at Sao Paulo Fashion Week. Fraga was influenced by the painting War and Peace by Brazilian artist Candido Portinari, who died in 1962, two years before the beginning of what would be the military dictatorship in Brazil. Helmets created by Marcos Costa, decorated with ornaments that the designers said represented the oppression of different sectors in Brazil in the past and present. Fraga also said that the imagery of weapons used in his show was intended to represent the country's current government after Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro loosened the nation's gun laws. Well, and finally, if you are noticing that women are a bit uh, sad today, it may be because one of the world's hottest bachelors is off the market. British actor Henry Selby and model Sabrina Dowie have tied the knot in a wedding in Morocco, according to British Vogue. The magazine says the pair married on Friday and that the celebrations were spread over three days in Marrakesh. The fashion publication also says that Elba wore a custom-made Oswald Boateng suit and Dowie uh, wore, wore a classic off-the-shoulder Vera Wang dress. In November 2018, Elba was named the sexiest man alive by People magazine becoming only the third non-white man to win the annual honor. And that's what's trending today. Well, and that's our show for today. Now be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings, today break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC. That's Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night.